Okay, so I'm Yang from Harvard, and today I'm going to talk about carbing, achieving efficient for tolerance for fat memory with erasure coding. So this is a joint work among Harvard, Google, University of Virginia, and Washington. So modern companies run many business critical memory intensive applications in data centers, including, for example, uh, graph processing, which has hundreds of billions of nodes these days, and in-memory databases, which stores growing data or tables into memory. So basically, these memory intensive applications store their huge data sets into local memory for fast and low latency accesses. However, memory provisioning for these applications is hard, mostly because the memory is limited by the server, the server physical boundary. For example, data center operators normally over-provision or reserve memory for application peak usage to avoid out-of-memory crashes. This partially causes only 40 to 60% of memory utilizations in data centers. To make things even worse, growing application data in one OS process may even exceed single server's memory limits. So with this problem, people are asking, can we just let applications dynamically utilize the unused memory on other servers? So there are a bunch of works on fine memory over commodity servers that try to answer this question. From high level, fine memory could be viewed as one specific type of memory disaggregation. We have, here we have a bunch of uh, cluster of commodity servers or nodes connected by fast data center network with 100G bandwidth and few microsecond latencies. So different nodes may host different applications, like, for example, node one, node one runs graph processing, and node two, oops. Uh, okay, yeah, for example, node, run, node one runs graph processing, node two runs an in-memory databases, and node four and five runs some email services. Um, at some moment, um, the memory-intensive graph processing and database applications use most of their local memory on their host nodes, while node four and five leaves a lot of unused memory. So file memory technique aggregates this unused memory into a file memory pool that is accessible via fast data center network and let memory intensive applications dynamically utilize, allocate this memory from this pool to store their data. And uh, so in this way, the data center operators could dynamically provision other servers on used memory to memory intensive applications. And these applications could possibly use much more memory than single server limit. Uh, so now let's just focus on one application running on one node and using fine memory pool to store its data. For brevity, we just call that node the local node and the set of nodes that could do donate file memory, the remote nodes. In our work, it was assumed the application could use uh, remote pointers as the interface to access file memory. This is the same as what people did in AIFM or application integrated file memory from OS 20. So let's first omit the dotted line. Um, so the application here holds remote pointers, which are very similar to, C, to smart pointers in C++. They basically encode information to locate objects that either reside in local or file memory, which are called, um, also called removable objects. The system runtime it will uh, swap in or fetch any object that the application wants to access. And in the background, it also um, swap out or evict code object to file memory. So the general idea of uh, file memory te technique sounds cool, right? However, one practical problem is what if any remote node fails? So let's assume that remote node two fails. Then the application data on that node will be lost. This, could cause, this would cause severe trouble or even crashes to the running applications on the local node. Essentially, if we did a simple mathematical calculation, we could find this probability of application crash will almost grow linearly as the number of remote nodes increases. So therefore, we argue that any practical file memory system must tolerate remote node failures. And that's the main thing of this talk, how to build a fault tolerant file memory system. So here we assume um, fail stop faults and no partial network failures, as we assume file memory system is normally deployed within a single cluster with reliable networks. But even under this assumption, it is still hard to achieve efficient fault tolerance, as we will show later. So in this talk, I will first go through why we think in-memory erasure coding is a good direction to go for file memory fault tolerance. Then I will present how Carbon makes in-memory erasure coding work in practice for file, for file memory systems. Finally, we will evaluate the performance and the cost. 
Okay, there are basically two general approaches for making data fault tolerant, replication or erasure coding. In the replication approach, for example, to tolerate two remote node failures, the local node could write each piece of data into three remote nodes. However, doing so incurs um, high memory overheads, right? Um, instead, in the erasure coding approach, uh, the local node could split each piece of data into four data chunks and generate two parity chunks based on erasure coding. Then write these six chunks to different remote nodes. So erasure coding guarantees that we can recover lost chunks upon up to um, two remote node failures. So this approach has much smaller memory usage compared to in-memory replication. Besides this, the erasure coding runs pretty fast on commodity servers like four gigabyte per second using single core. So therefore, considering memory usage, we prefer erasure coding for fine memory. Well, you might think of can we use SSD to store these replicas or parity data? Um, well, this does save memory, but doing so would force application performance to bottleneck by SSD, uh, especially during burst workload and um, failure recovery. It's also demonstrated by prior work. Therefore, we prefer um, in memory for tolerance for fine memory. Great, I just talked about um, in memory erasure coding has the benefits of high performance and low memory usage. Next, I'm gonna talk about how Tarbing makes in memory erasure coding work in practice. Specifically, we will look at two challenges. The first challenge is about um, how to handle remote board objects that have different sizes. So recall that in the AFM like file memory system, the abstract application data into remote pointers, uh, remote objects. Depending on application needs, this object could have different sizes. So however, erasure coding on irregular size object is hard because the erasure coding normally requires equal size chunks to generate parity chunks. You may do padding to align these objects, but this would waste the padding space memory. You may try to even split each object into smaller chunks equally, but doing so for small object would incur large metadata to store additionally, such as each chunk's location. So to efficiently erasure code irregular size objects, carbon approach is to group similar size into spans, similar size object into spans, just like how some memory allocator manage their object, for example, Google's TC malloc. So those spans are page aligned and um, regular sized, thus well suited for erasure coding. For example, for one kilobyte object, we pack eight of them into a, one, into a eight kilobyte span, for some larger object like 3.3 .3 kilobyte, we pack seven of them into a 24 kilobyte span with small fragmentation. So basically we'll borrow the configuration from TC malloc to pack object into proper sized spans in a way that the end of span fragmentation is minimized. So we call this approach span-centric memory pooling and apply it to um, both a object management and data swapping between the local and far memory. So basically, this approach generates spans that are always page aligned and never end up with a uh, partial object, which are easy for managing and apply erasure coding. Okay, um, another challenge of apply erasure coding to file memory system is about um, how to achieve efficient swapping. So a natural way of apply erasure coding is suggested in the Hydro paper, which is um, based on four kilobyte OS pages. In our span contest, we call it easy split. So as the name goes, um, it basically splits each span into four, like for example, four data chunks, generate two parity chunks, and write these six chunks to remote nodes. To, to remote nodes. However, the drawback of doing so is that um, the local node normally need multiple network I/O operations to swap in or out single span because of span splitting. These excessive network I/O operations would stress the network stack and lead to slow swapping. It also makes the uh, swappings or data fetch vulnerable to stragglers, for example, stragglers from the network. This would cause high tail latency for remote accesses. So with this drawback, um, we were thinking of can we avoid splitting spans? This is achieved in our new approach called easy batch by erasure coding span sets. So here basically a span set is a group of equal size spans. As shown in the right diagram, we swap out a batch of four equal size spans and their parity to remote nodes. Averagely, each span swap out only requires 1.4 number, 1.5 number of I.O. operations. During swapping, we only need single network I.O. operation to fetch the specific span that contains the desired objects. 
This achieves fast swapping and low tail latency without being vulnerable to strugglers. However, um, as we swap in and swap out in different granularity, this would cause remote fragmentation. For example, in this diagram, local node swap out spans at one to far memory. It then swapping span one and two into local memory. Because the fact that each span only lives in one place is the local file memory, this leaves two invalid span size holes in span set one on file memory. Similarly, it creates two invalid holes in another span set two. This invalid holes would, would persist and cause file memory fragmentation because in future swap outs, we always, the easy batch will always write out new span sets. So to defragment these holes, easy batch runs remote compaction in the background. In the same example, the remote compaction basically merges the remaining spans, the remaining spans in span set one and two into a new span set three with new parity data. This also creates a bunch of free space that comes from the hosts in span set one and two, which can be used for later span set swap outs. So here, um, during merging spans, we do not need to really memory copy span data, but instead, the local node maintains a span set mapping that map each span set to its spans. To merge the remaining spans into a new span set, we just invalidate the old entry, the entry for the old span sets, and insert a new entry for the new span set. So with this, this layer of interaction, our remote compaction achieves zero copy span merging. Here, I also want to highlight that the remote compaction um, does not impact the span swapping performance because it is totally off the critical path of span swappings or swap outs. The only penalty is that it might consume um, more file memory because some dead spans may not be compacted immediately. So we will evaluate this point later. Okay, so that ends uh, carbon design, which adopts span-centric memory pooling to manage um, irregular or arbitrary size objects, and then applies erasure coding to, uh, to span sets to achieve efficient swapping. Next, we will evaluate the performance and cost of this design. We use three types of workloads covering in-memory database transactions, graph processing, and micro-benchmark studying system sensitivity. We evaluate on various dimensions, throughput, tail latency, remote mem memory usage, and more in the paper. Um, we use commodity servers with 50G NICs and Pony Express user space nano stack. This nano stack provides efficient uh, one-sided RMAs for span swapping and RPCs for remote compaction. We first look at the throughput of transactional key value store. As shown in this figure, x-axis shows a very the size of local memory, and y-axis shows the transaction throughput of EC split versus our EC batch, both under span-centric design. So both schemes throughput um, will increase as the local memory increases. With higher local memory, these two perform similarly because the working set of this um, workload mostly fit into local memory in this case, incurring very few swaps. But with smaller local memory, our easy batch achieves up to 1.x speed up over easy split, mostly due to less IO operations per swap. Next, we look at the swapping tail latency. In this figure, access is a throughput of accessing remote ball objects, while WAXS shows a 99 percentile latency of these accesses. Overall, we found easy batch achieves 1.2x to 1.4x tail latency reduction over easy split. This is because easy batch only need single IO operations per data fetch. Regarding the remote memory usage, easy batch has at most 35% more memory usage than easy split due to the remote compaction of the critical paths. But it is still only two thirds of replication memory usage. So there are more results in the paper to check it out. Um, to summarize, in this talk, we argue that fault tolerance is a must-have feature for applications to use file memory. Our system, Carbink, makes erasure coding-based fault tolerance work in practice for file memory systems. By grouping objects into spans to handle arbitrary-sized objects and erasure coding span sets to achieve single I.O., single network I.O. data fetch. As a result, it achieved up to 1.5x application speed up and 1.4x tail latency reduction at the price of a bit high memory usage. Finally, in a high level, we think um, performance and fault tolerance are the two keys to enabling memory disaggregation, and Carbon is a step forward towards a fault tolerance direction. With this, I'm happy to take any questions.